Uh, so I'm Michael Hart. I'm one of the third year cardiology fellows. And I have nothing to disclose, though if you joined me last year for our first virtual Grand Rounds, you'll remember this is how we started, with you listening in from home in your bathrobe. <laughs> and this is pretty much how the rest of 2020 went. <clears throat> but it's a new year with hopefully the end of this pandemic right around the corner. And so without further delay, let's jump into today's objectives. We'll start by reviewing the virology and bio biology of SARS-CoV-2 infection <clears throat> and how it may affect our practice day to day. We'll explore the epidemiology of COVID-19 and its relationship with underlying cardiovascular disease. We'll seek to understand the pathophysiology of acute CV manifestations in COVID. And finally, discuss COVID's impact on athletes and recommendations for return to play. So how did we get here? Well, here's a rough timeline starting in late December when the first few cases were identified in Wuhan, China. Shortly thereafter, we had successfully identified and sequenced the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And by January 20th, we had our first case in the US. By March 11th, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. And here we are today with roughly 27 million cases and over 470,000 deaths in the US alone. So what is SARS-CoV-2? Well, it hails from a family of viruses that also includes SARS-CoV-1, responsible for the 2002-2004 SARS outbreak, and MERS-CoV, responsible for the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, first identified in Saudi Arabia in 2012. Now, SARS-CoV-2 is an enveloped, single-stranded, positive-sense RNA virus with innumerable spike proteins on its surface that give this group of viruses its namesake, coronavirus or crown virus. And these spike proteins are important as they help facilitate viral cell entry by binding to membrane-bound ACE2 receptor located on the target cell surface. Now, once inside the cell, the virus undergoes replication of its genome and structural building blocks, ultimately leading to assembly and release for further propagation. Now, a quick word on that ACE2 receptor, given that this was a major hot topic in the cardiology world last spring. As mentioned, this receptor plays a key role in SARS-CoV-2 cell entry and actually has multi-organ expression, helping explain the broad pattern of illness we see in COVID infection, including cardiac manifestations. The problem with this is that angiotensin II, as the main effector molecule in the RAS system, is known to have pro-inflammatory and vasoconstrictive effects which is why it's a prime target for many of the therapies we use in CV practice every day. As such, in the setting of COVID-19 infection, that ACE2 receptor becomes monopolized by the SARS-CoV-2 virus and in fact down-regulated, leading to further downstream deleterious sequela from increasing levels of AMG2. In animal models, ACE and ARBs have been shown to upregulate the expression of ACE2 which led to the concern that these agents may increase risk for contraction of and disease severity with COVID-19. To address this question, there have been several studies, including this multi-center randomized control trial out of Brazil, assessing 660 patients previously prescribed ACE or ARBs who were hospitalized with COVID-19 and randomized to continue or discontinue their drug for 30 days. Now, primary outcome is as listed, and some of the many secondary outcomes are listed as well. The median age was 55. 40% of these patients were female, and the majority of them were on ARBs, with a fairly even split between mild and moderate disease. All of these patients carried a diagnosis of hypertension, and many of them had other CV risk factors as well. They found no significant difference in the primary outcome between groups, 
and secondary outcomes differed only for length of stay, slightly favoring the continuation group, but otherwise for death, CV death, and progression of COVID-19 disease, as well as all other secondary outcome metrics, there was no difference seen. In the subgroup analysis, there were interactions between treatment effect and presenting oxygen saturation, as well as clinical COVID-19 severity adjudicated on admission, also favoring the continuation group, though this was not the primary aim of the study. These findings, in addition to several large meta-analyses, led major medical societies across the globe to conclude there are no experimental or clinical data demonstrating beneficial or adverse outcomes among COVID-19 patients using ACE or ARBs. So now that we have a handle on how SARS-CoV-2 infects people, let's move on to who it infects the most. As we stand today, the U.S. remains a world leader in COVID-19 cases with a somewhat bimodal age distribution, but mortality certainly dominated by our elderly population. Historically, pre-existing CV conditions were frequently seen in patients during both the SARS and MERS outbreaks. Diabetes and cardiovascular disease were seen in around 10% of SARS cases with associated significant increased risk for mortality. With MERS, these comorbid conditions were even more frequent with diabetes seen in up to half of patients and hypertension almost a third. So despite the relative genetic homology between these viruses, would this remain true for COVID-19? Well, there have been numerous studies focusing on the epidemiology of COVID, with some of the largest data sets coming out of those places afflicted the most, China, Italy, and New York. Initial data on almost 1,600 patients infected with SARS-CoV-2 and admitted to the ICU tells a tale of sick, older Italian men with not much in the way of non-CV pre-existing conditions, but a high prevalence of CV comorbidities with hypertension leading the way, not to mention an alarmingly high case fatality rate. Around the same time, a study out of New York was published on 5,700 patients hospitalized with COVID. In their experience, which included improved female representation and racial diversity, non-CV comorbidities were present to a similar degree as what we saw prior, while CV comorbidities continue to be very prevalent, with diabetes present in a third of patients who are notably more likely to require mechanical ventilation or ICU admission than non-diabetics. Now, not to be left out of the conversation, obesity rears its ugly head in this study and was present in a substantial number of patients, highlighting likely how our local obesity epidemic may uniquely increase Americans' risk during this global pandemic. Further strengthening the signal of CV comorbidity seen in critically ill patients was this review looking at clinical characteristics of 1,100 patients diagnosed with COVID, spanning 522 hospitals across mainland China. Now, these patients were retrospectively adjudicated into two groups, severe and non-severe cases based off of American Thoracic Society guidelines. And primary composite outcome, as defined, occurred in 6.1% of patients, which was driven mostly by admission to the ICU. About a quarter of all of these patients had one of the listed comorbidities, which were more frequently seen in those cases adjudicated as severe, those that did suffer from the primary outcome tended to be older with more diabetes, hypertension, and coronary heart disease than those that didn't. So why is this the case? Is it because these comorbidities are more prevalent in our aging population, a group that we know is already at an increased risk for infection? Or does it speak to this increased baseline inflammatory milieu that patients with pre-existing hypertension and obesity live with? and thus predisposing them to infection and severe infection. Well, it's very difficult to tease out the specifics, but as CV providers, we know it's our patients that are getting sick with COVID, and it's our patients that are doing poorly with COVID. 
Now, no discussion on the epidemiology of COVID in the United States would be complete without mentioning at least briefly the role healthcare disparities has played. With black and Hispanic populations accounting for a disproportionate share of cases and deaths relative to their piece of the population pie. And while these data are imperfect, what we have tells us that throughout much of the country, these communities are at up to two times higher risk of hospitalization with COVID and significantly increased risk of mortality. Findings not fully explained, even when accounting for the higher rates of hypertension and other CV comorbidities we see in these groups. Now, more recent data would suggest in-hospital mortality is actually similar to the non-Hispanic white population, which raises the question, what is driving this increased risk? Well, certainly disparity-related exposure is a major role and is a metric directly linked to socioeconomic status. These groups are more likely to live in a densely populated area where social distancing can be difficult, if not impossible. They are disproportionately represented in essential work settings, have less access to care, and suffer from long-standing stigma associated with the medical community. Again, these two slides don't do the entire problem justice, but rather highlight factors that we need to remain cognizant of when caring for these patients. So we discussed the epidemiology. Let's turn our focus to the manifestations of COVID-19, particularly how it relates to the cardiovascular system. In general, up to 80% of patients are either asymptomatic or have mild constitutional symptoms with COVID. Another 10 to 15% will develop more substantial symptoms, including and typically significant dyspnea related to hypoxemia from lower respiratory infection with COVID or COVID pneumonia, while an added 5% will develop full-blown respiratory failure, septic shock, and potentially multi-organ compromise. From a cardiovascular standpoint, there is a multitude of ways in which COVID can be deleterious. These including acute myocardial injury, ACS, myocarditis, stress cardiomyopathy, thrombosis and coagulopathy, and arrhythmia. With a close interplay between the CV comorbidities we've discussed thus far and the risk for downstream sequela. We'll highlight several of these manifestations, starting with acute myocardial injury. Now this figure, courtesy of one of our former graduates, Dr. Yadar Sandoval, nicely outlines the different myocardial injury patterns seen in COVID-19, with emphasis particularly placed on correct adjudication, dependent on factors such as acuity and presence or absence of ischemia. And to help achieve accurate adjudication, it's important we first ensure we're all speaking the same language. According to the fourth universal definition of MI, myocardial injury is defined as a troponin level detected above the 99th percentile upper reference limit, with those deemed acute as having dynamic change, typically by 20% or more, in a rise and or fall pattern. Now, to meet the criteria for myocardial infarction, you also need evidence of ischemia such as classic symptoms or new ischemic ECG changes, new Q-wave development, or imaging findings of new or presumed new regional wall motion abnormality consistent with an ischemic etiology. And while type 1 MI, or traditional acute coronary syndrome caused by plaque rupture with superimposed thrombosis, has been reported in the setting of COVID-19, it certainly is more rare than type 2 MI, which can be a manifestation of several different pathologies, though in general is thought to be secondary to supply-demand mismatch. In the context of COVID, this can be a product of respiratory failure or sustained tachyarrhythmia, hypotension, or shock, all potentially occurring in the background of flow-limiting coronary heart disease, limiting supply. 
Now, diving deeper into causes of myocardial injury, primary non-cardiac myocardial injury is thought to be related to this systemic cytokine storm we've heard so much about in the setting of COVID infection. In these patients, we see relative elevations in inflammatory biomarkers as listed. They typically have smaller degrees of troponin, exhibit milder cases of disease with lower incidence of cardiac symptoms and or downstream sequelae, including arrhythmia, new cardiomyopathy, et cetera. Conversely, direct myocardial injury as a result of, say, myocarditis or myopericarditis tends to come with higher levels of troponin elevation, more severe cases of disease, and a higher incidence of symptoms and downstream sequelae. So I know what you're thinking. Who cares about all this tropomania? Well, certainly accurate adjudication of these cases is going to direct your management. But beyond that, there have been several studies on the prevalence of myocardial injury in COVID-19 and its effect on morbidity and mortality. One such study is this retrospective analysis out of the Mount Sinai Health System on 2,700 patients admitted with COVID-19 who had a troponin elevation or level collected, excuse me, on admission. These patients were subsequently stratified into normal, mildly elevated, and elevated groups. 36% of these patients were found to have an elevation in troponin with statistically significant differences seen between groups in CV comorbid conditions, these including AFib, CAD, and heart failure. Furthermore, while the majority of these patients had a troponin elevation less than one, even lower risks of lower levels of elevation were associated with an increased risk of in-hospital mortality with an adjusted hazard ratio of 1.75 a finding that was even more dramatic with higher elevations and held true when stratifying by comorbid conditions. So certainly we as CVT members get consulted on troponin elevations every day. And we should understand the implications of that troponin elevation, one, depending on the degree of elevation, and two, depending on the clinical substrate, as not all troponin elevations are indicative of underlying ACS, nor underlying heart failure. Moving on to thrombosis and coagulopathy, ARDS is a known and feared complication of severe COVID infection, which is believed at least in part to be due to the robust expression of ACE2 within type two pneumocytes, setting the stage for this local and systemic cytokine storm characterized by endothelial disruption, platelet activation, fibrin production and cross-linking, and ultimately downstream thrombotic and thromboembolic events. The rate of these events certainly is driven by VTE and is typically occurring in our sickest patients, those admitted to the ICU. Now pictured here is a comprehensive schema from a review recently released by JAHA on the mechanisms of thrombosis and thromboembolic disease in the setting of COVID, with emphasis placed on potential role of drug therapy in prevention and treatment at different stages throughout the coagulation cascade. Now speaking to that, current NIH guidelines recommend continuation of oral anticoagulants if previously prescribed, as well as vigilant prophylaxis highlighting the anti-inflammatory effects, particularly seen with Lovenox, which may also have antiviral properties through its binding of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which we discussed earlier. Notably, there is no data at this time to support routine DVT screening in patients with COVID. And last but not least, arrhythmia. We know palpitations is a fairly common complaint in these patients that are admitted. Though the true prevalence is difficult to parse out given variable definitions of what constitutes arrhythmia and the data we have thus far. 
We also know that both atrial and ventricular dysrhythmias have been reported in the setting of COVID-19, with one single center study reporting malignant arrhythmias, defined as sustained VT or VF, in 6% of its critically ill patients. Now, some of these proposed mechanisms include myocardial injury, both ischemic and non-ischemic, QT prolongation, either in the setting of general illness or maybe related to some of the therapies that have been proposed for COVID-19, and again, electrolyte disturbances in hyperinflammatory states, speaking to the multi-organ dysfunction that we can see with COVID infection, all potentially occurring in the background of pre-existing scar. To close, let's turn our attention to COVID's impact on athletes. Now, the sports world has been uniquely affected by this pandemic. With a media frenzy surrounding reports of COVID-19 in athletes, and in many instances, gross misinterpretation of available data leading to panic and discord. As a result, you've seen major sports organizations do their part in curbing the spread and allowing for sports to go on, with the MLB, NBA, and NFL all taking it very seriously. Joking aside, this has raised several important questions, starting with, are athletes at risk? Well, pre-participation evaluations have shown us that the majority of these patients, even more so than the general population, are going to be asymptomatic. And if they do have symptoms, they're typically nonspecific and coupled with an unremarkable exam. Furthermore, many clinicians are unsure about what is appropriate as an initial workup? Who should I be ordering this for? And how do I tease out, once I have completed this workup, what is exercise-induced remodeling and what is pathologic change? Now, we do know that pre-COVID, viral myocarditis accounts for 7 to 20% of sudden cardiac death cases in young athletes. As in the active stage of myocarditis, Exercise can accelerate viral replication and create this unstable myocardial substrate, creating a nidus for malignant dysrhythmia and sudden death. Thankfully, the ACC Sports and Exercise section released return to play recommendations in May of last year with a more recent update this fall. And they really start with focusing on the goal of return to play, which namely is identifying high-risk athletes and limiting the spread. The way in which these recommendations are applied are certainly dependent on community factors such as prevalence of disease and resource availability. But in general, this consensus body does not recommend routine screening of athletes who are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, which again will account for the vast majority. However, in a certain subset of patients, those that have more prominent symptoms or elicit a higher level of concern, further workup is indicated. Starting with one of our most basic ubiquitous tools, the electrocardiogram, Despite its relative low sensitivity and specificity, particularly for diagnosing myocarditis alone, it is widely available, though particular care must be taken, again, in delineating athlete or youth-related changes versus pathologic changes related to COVID. Some of these changes that you may see in athletes include bradycardia or first-degree AV block as a product of increased vagal tone, chamber enlargements, early repolarization changes, juvenile T waves. Some red flags that should not be chalked up to youth-related or athletic changes include ST segment depression, left bundle branch block, excessive QT prolongation, high-grade AV block, and certainly ventricular arrhythmia. And as with interpreting any ECG, it's always helpful to compare to the prior and take that into context with the additional clinical data that you've collected. 
Here we see an example of early repolarization pattern with J-point elevation and concave ST segment elevation seen pretty diffusely. This phenomenon can be seen in up to 40% of highly trained athletes, more commonly among black male athletes and those that meet voltage criteria for LVH. Here is an example of juvenile T waves in a healthy 11-year-old, which again can be normal, though should not be present, present beyond the age of 16 years old, and should not also be present in the lateral precordial leads, nor with concomitant ST segment depression. And finally, here's an example of what you may see with acute mild pericarditis. Again, we have an ECG showing diffuse concave ST elevation, this time with concomitant PR depression, which might kind of tip you off that something else is at play, though it certainly highlights how difficult it can be in differ differentiating pathology from normal physiology in this population using ECG alone. Moving on to echo forces us to review the physiology of exercise first and how it can lead to a cardiac remodeling. Now during exercise, we see up to a five-fold increase in cardiac output, mainly as a product of increased heart rate, though also through augmentation of stroke volume as well. Loading conditions also certainly change, with an increase in preload through capacitance venoconstriction and a drop in SVR. ABO2 difference is maximized, by redistributing blood flow to the muscles and optimizing oxygen extraction by the tissues. All of these changes over time can lead to cardiac remodeling, the degree to which depends on the static or dynamic demands of your sport. In general, these changes are more frequently seen in endurance athletes and typically includes increases in both LV and RV size, and potentially slight reductions in function as well, though certainly nothing focal. Myocardial contractile reserve should also be present, and diastolic function may be supernormal as a product of enhanced leucotropy. Some red flags that should prompt further investigation include LV dilation beyond the parameters listed, regional wall motion abnormality, decrement in EF below 50%, or isolated RV abnormalities. Now moving on to more advanced imaging mod modalities, cardiac MRI is the gold standard in assessment of chamber size, volume, and function, as well as tissue characterization with T1 and T2 weighted imaging, parametric mapping, and patterns of contrast enhancement with gadolinium. In the setting of COVID, MRI has been particularly useful in the diagnosis of myocarditis in both the general population and in athletes. With that being said, we rely on the Lake Louise criteria recently updated in 2018 to include some of those parametric mapping techniques I mentioned to help clinch the diagnosis of myocarditis in the setting of moderate to high pretest probability. The MRI surrogates of myocarditis include elevations in T1, T2, and ECV as a result of accumulating inflammatory debris and edema in the myocardium. In addition, you see presence of late gadolinium enhancement in a sub-epicardial or mid-myocardial non-coronary distribution, classically affecting the basal to mid-lateral wall. This is in contrast to the sub-endocardial LGE you see in a coronary territory distribution in the setting of ischemia. Now, since the start of this pandemic, <clears throat> There have been several studies reporting cardiac MRI findings in patients with COVID-19, including this hotly debated study out of Germany, analyzing 100 patients recovered from varying degrees of illness with COVID compared to healthy and risk factor matched controls.
Median time from positive COVID test to imaging was 71 days, and they reported 78% of patients to have abnormalities by cardiac MRI, with T1 and T2 having the best discriminatory ability in detecting COVID-19-related myocardial involvement compared to control groups. Now, as I mentioned, these findings are not without controversy. In fact, they created a major buzz throughout the Twitter sphere, many pointing out the dangers inherent to drawing conclusions from isolated subclinical cardiac MRI abnormalities, not to mention irregularities found in the group's data analysis and reporting, ultimately prompting the authors to reanalyze and republish their findings after correction. Comparatively, in a smaller study out of China, reporting on a younger and overall healthier cohort of 26 patients recovered from COVID-19, 58% of these patients had abnormal cardiac MRI findings with significant differences seen in global T1, T2, and ECV when compared to controls. In addition, LGE, predominantly in that sub-epicardial and patchy mid-wall pattern we discussed earlier. Even more recently, we've seen an emergence of data on cardiac MRI in athletes post-COVID-19, several in the form of limited research letters with small sample size, incomplete methodology reporting, and data set publication. The most recent of these coming out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where only two out of the 145 athletes imaged met updated Lake Louise criteria, the first had no symptoms, but marked LGE and T2 elevation, as well as positive high sensitivity troponin. And the second had mild to moderate symptoms, only mild LGE burden and T2 elevation with a normal troponin. Now, both of these patients showed improvement when re-imaged at one month. And looking at this collection of data overall, you see overall lower rates of abnormalities than what has been reported in the general population thus far. Interestingly, there have been several autopsy reports identifying SARS-CoV-2 genome in the myocardium, including this study on 39 consecutive patients who died from COVID-19. 62% of these patients had detectable viral RNA within the myocardial tissue two-thirds of which was deemed to be at a significant level. Now, this infiltration appeared to occur within the interstitium as opposed to direct infection of the cardiomyocytes themselves. Higher viral titers were associated with an increase in cytokine levels and presence of viral progeny, indicative of active replication. However, there was not an increase in mononuclear cell infiltration when compared to the virus negative group. In addition, massive cell infiltration or cell necrosis was not seen, and these are the histologic markers of myocarditis. Now, despite all these data, and what I somewhat alluded to before, we must acknowledge several notable limitations before drawing any concrete conclusions. These include the retrospective observational nature of most of these studies, reporting subclinical findings with lack of control groups and normative data, particularly in the athletic population. Notably, there are vendor and site-specific variations and parametric mapping thresholds, which also makes interpretation and generalizability of these studies very difficult. And overall, we don't know what the short and long-term implications of these findings are. Again, in the presence of questionable symptoms, if symptoms at all, pointing to the need for larger, multi-center, prospective randomized controlled trials again, before drawing any concrete conclusions. With this in mind, several organizations, including the ACC, have released expert consensus recommendations on return to play for athletes dealing with and recovering from COVID-19 infection. 
The ACC provides several algorithms based on age and development of the athlete, including an algorithm for master's level athletes like Notorious RGB. Pictured here is one such schema that applies to most high school athletes in competitive sports. As you can see, this decision tree starts with symptom presence and severity and provides recommendations for when risk stratification should occur, utilizing the diagnostic tools we've highlighted earlier. Additionally, there is particular emphasis placed on pretest probability, an ongoing theme throughout this talk, before jumping to more advanced diagnostics. In comparison, published guidance in the UK advocates for casting a slightly wider net with cardiovascular screening, suggesting cardiac MRI may be used earlier in the screening pathway in patients with persistent symptoms, though notably is intended for elite athletes in professional sports alone. Now here are some take home points from this ACC expert consensus document, namely that these recommendations and general criteria for return to play include LV and RV function normalization, biomarker normalization, and absence of inducible arrhythmia. The fact that significant cardiovascular sequela in athletes is quite rare which really speaks to the fact, again, that the majority of these athletes are asymptomatic or with mild symptoms, in which case CV risk stratification is not required, and these patients can undergo return to play 10 days from symptom onset. In more severe or persistent cases, CV risk stratification is recommended and opens the door for more advanced testing should that initial workup return abnormal. Myocarditis is a clinical syndrome and should not be diagnosed based off of MRI findings in isolation. And in turn, the use of cardiac MRI should be reserved for those patients with a high pretest probability for myocarditis and not for all athletes. Finally, should you find evidence of myocardial involvement, Previously published ACC guidelines for return to play following garden variety myocarditis should be followed, notably requiring at least a three month break from sport with risk stratification following that. So in conclusion, we went over the biology of SARS-CoV-2 infection. We spoke on the epidemiology of COVID-19 and its relationship with underlying cardiovascular disease. We discussed the pathophysiology of acute CV manifestations, and finally, covered COVID's impact on athletes and recommendations for return to play. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Hurley. Yeah. Mike, excellent review. That was, that was terrific. You know, I, I was doing outreach and clinical lot this last week, and I'll tell you that um, this is becoming incredibly prevalent to see these patients in clinic. I think on one day I saw four of them. Fortunately, none of them with um, serious findings, but I would say that the most common thing I found is persistent sinus tachycardia. Sorry. Coming in at heart rate 100 to 110 all the time. If they do anything, it goes to 130 to 150. Um, I, I've seen only one patient so far that had a significant cardiomyopathy that fortunately recovered. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think at least for the next year, we're going to be seeing a lot of these patients in clinic that are going to have a variety of complaints, but many of them have chest pain, palpitations, shortness of breath, fatigue, all the things we've heard. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the recommendations, as we've already seen thus far, will continue to evolve, hopefully as the data that we have available for interpretation continues to evolve. But this problem is not going away. And so, you know, preparing yourself with you know, at least the stuff that we have thus far in the way of expert consensus recommendations, et cetera, you know, with in mind keeping your recommendations to patients being on a case-by-case -case basis is, is going to be an ongoing theme for, for a while now. I totally agree. Okay, thanks again. Uh, Mitch, I know that athletes and sports and all is important, but it's more of entertainment than the numbers. Uh, more so important is intervention. And I'm talking of surgery, for example. I just got a phone call 
that my first patient today was tested positive two weeks ago. Um, the question now hangs is, should we go ahead and you know, do surgery, open heart surgery? Mm -hmm. uh, there is enough literature to show that open heart surgery in presence of active COVID can lead to a variety of problems, such as you know, prominent pelvic episodes, hit, renal failure, and there's no guideline at present to my knowledge. Anything you can add to it? Yeah, I, to be frank, I, I didn't read too much in that way, but you know, I understand certainly the concern given, you know, even though some of these MRI findings may be subclinical per se, you know, the autopsy results speak to at least some degree of increased inflammatory milieu within the myocardial tissue, which in the context of, you know, impending cardiac surgery could certainly be a concern. So, um, yeah, I, I haven't read anything specifically, but, um, but certainly happy to look more into it. So there's no policy at present. Our general policy is wait for at least a month. Mm -hmm. And then if they're negative, and of course, asymptomatic, Etc. Sure. They repeat the echo and then go ahead and elect your patient. Right. Uh, but that's very empiric at present. Yep. Excellent. Well, thanks for your attention, everybody. We have more questions. Sure. I was waiting. Oh, please. No, go ahead. <laughs> many questions. This was a great talk. And uh, I think the more we, we are going to definitely, you said very rightly, this is not going to go away for the next five years. So we better be prepared. Uh, you made a comment which is very interesting. I always look at statistics. Uh, being in New York when it all started, is U.S. gets a bit unfair treatment because uh, it's we should have statistics per million people rather than country. Because a small country like New Zealand may have only 2,300 cases, but it's a 4 million population. And here it's 350, and we have whatever 1 million cases. Now it's to do with testing as well, etc. Uh, any correlation between uh, COVID positive patients, ECG findings, myocarditis, uh, you know, and going back to whether the test was false positive, because you're going to see more patients, I suppose, with a lot of ECG changes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, I know in general, the sensitivity and specificity are, are very limited, particularly in isolation. I think if you see ECG changes um, that concern you, and it's in the context of you know maybe an elevated troponin, now in the setting of our high sensitivity assays, I mean, that could be everybody in this room. But regardless, I, I think trying to put it all together uh, rather than you know banking on one modality alone, especially ECG, um, given the limitations that we've discussed already, um, would probably be your best bet. I don't know of anything specifically correlating you know, that finding with, you know, downstream formal diagnosis of myocarditis. Any questions on the way? Nothing online, so unless there's anything else very, in here. Very good talk. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <clears throat>